Thank you and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. As Marianne said, my name is Jemai Manjuki, um, Director for Africa at the International Food Policy Research Institute. And what I wanted to do is sort of frame the conversation and give some data on the status of youth, not just in agriculture, but much more broadly um, um, in, in rural areas. And from there, uh, place the context in terms of uh, what's happening in agriculture. As we wait for, for the slide to, to come up, um, so in 2019, uh, the Africa Union, the Regional Strategic Analysis and Knowledge Support System, RESAX, uh, we dedicated the annual trends and outlook report to focus on gender equality in rural Africa and to discussions on how we could move from commitments uh, to action. And this was in recognition of two things. Um, one, that we could not achieve or we cannot achieve the commitments of the Malabo Declaration of having poverty by 2025, reducing malnutrition, achieving inclusive growth, et cetera, without addressing gender inequality and the empowerment of women and youth. And two, because we know that women are critical enabler of inclusive agricultural growth in the continent, and at the same time, we really cannot talk about women's empowerment in rural Africa without talking about agriculture. So those are actually very intertwined. And so we used a framework that recognizes that in many uh, parts of Africa, agriculture is a, is a family enterprise, a very gendered family enterprise that assets within this enterprise can be held individually by men and women, they can be held jointly, that shocks such as climate change, COVID-19, are affect, as we have seen, are affecting men and women in very different ways. And even the outcomes of agricultural growth can benefit some groups uh, more than others. And we especially wanted to have a specific focus on young women and men. And so the Annual Trends and Outlook Report 2019 has a section on, on, on youth. And the reason is we wanted to use an intersectional approach to understand the constraints and opportunities for this group and to figure out how interventions can be targeted in ways um, that can benefit this group. So how do we define the youth um, in, in this instance? We used the range of 15 to 24 years, and we focused on 15 to 24 year olds because it is such an imp important period of transition uh, for young people. It is when decisions are made related to marriage, to childbearing, whether to continue school, the type of job to find, and these decisions in a way set them on an important trajectory for, for their lives. But more importantly, during this part of the life cycle, we find that while many opportunities are opening uh, for young men, they are often closing for young women. And there is also a lot of evidence about the large youth cohorts in, in, in African countries owing to the progression of the demographic transition. Now we can look at this group of young people as a threat or as an opportunity. And as we have seen from the previous session uh, with, with young women, it is really an opportunity. And I believe very strongly that our youth are an opportunity to help us realize economic growth. But we also know that a lot of structural transformation is happening in our, in our countries. The share of jobs in, in manufacturing, if you could please go to the next slide, the next one. The next one, please. Sorry for that inter interruption. And the next one. There. Um, so we recognize there's a lot of structural transformation um, that's happening in our countries. They are not uh, uh, static. The structural transformation means that we are seeing a lot of growth in, in, in jobs in the service sector, uh, shrinking of jobs in the, in the agriculture sector. 
And these different types of jobs may actually lead to different opportunities and benefits for, for, for young women. Uh, the next slide, please. So we analyzed data uh, that we pulled together from nationally representative demographic and health service from 25 countries in the, in the continent and also used some country level data from the world development indicators. And I just want to highlight um, some of the results and some of the differences that we see between young men and, and, uh, and opportunities that we see between young men and young, and young women. And I'll start with land ownership. So for rural households and rural youth, we know land is often the most valuable asset. A lot of those young people in agriculture will tell you they have to find land to, to, to cultivate. Some of them are purchasing, they are inheriting, some of them are expecting to inherit in the future. They may own it on their own, some are owning it jointly, some are co-owning with, with spouses, with parents or with other people. Um, it may be linked to marriage, land ownership, either by signaling marriage ability or as inheritance received upon marriage. At least we know that's how a lot of land is passing to young people. What we first observe is that many rural youths don't yet own land. Uh, among rural youth who do own land, young men are more often sole owners of land while young women are more often joint owners, likely because they have married earlier or have a joint claim to land via marriage. What I do want us to note is that this joint claim, especially joint claim via marriage, may not always be permanent, such as in the case of divorce or, or widowhood. Uh, next slide, please. The other aspect of, of youth that I want to talk about, uh, and especially that's important uh, for this age group, is employment and what we call NEET, N-E-E-T. So during this period of their life cycle, young men and women may still be in school or some form of vocation training. They may be working, all in a combination of work and school. Um, even still, there may be youth who aren't involved in any, uh, in any of these, and we refer to these youth as neither in employment, education, or training. And when we look at the data across all regions, East, East Africa, Southern Africa, West and Central um, Africa, we see typically there are more young women classified as neither in employment, uh, education or training than young men. But to notice that this definition actually fails to consider that neat young women are often um, involved in household labor uh, contributions. So it doesn't mean they are idling um, around. What we see from these graphs, uh, if you can see the, the, the bars, is that more young women, more young men are enrolled in school than young women, and more young men are working compared to young women. Overall, approximately two thirds of rural youth are working in on-farm um, activities. But the marital status or what these young men and women are, uh, are, whether they are in a marital union or not, is, is important because young women who are married or had young children are more likely to be neither in education, employment or in training. But young men, among young men, they are more likely to be working for some form of payment if they're married. What this shows is it indicates that young women are likely involved in caregiving roles and contributing invisible labor. And I think this was mentioned in the last session, despite what this neither in, in employment, in education, employment or training may actually um, infer. Uh, 
But for young men, what this also suggests is that many young fathers are working and may actually lose out on opportunities to participate in caregiver roles. Uh, someone talked about it in the earlier session about young women being wired to be emotionally connected to, to, to children. But there is a lot of young men who also would like to be engaged in that, but because of the expectations of, of them getting employment, that that is not happening. So just a quick summary is, is that rural young men in transition to adulthood have fewer resources, land, education than rural young men. They are less likely to own land and when as sole owners. So when they own land, it is more uh, joint with, with others. And we have more rural young men being classified as neither in education, employment or, or uh, training but this uh, label does not consider what they're doing um, in, in as unpaid uh, care. Rural young women and men are running uphill at higher levels of structural and transformational, uh, transformational change. And to me, the overarching conclusion from these findings is we have a call to action. So I trigger you to think, how can we foster economic opportunities that benefit both rural young women and rural young men? And the next two slides, as, as I go to my conclusion, look at the gender responsive youth programming, asking how can gender sensitive youth livelihood programming harness the potential of this demographic dividend that we talk about so that it creates equal opportunities for both young women and young men. And to do this, uh, I, I let me just say what I mean by gender sensitive uh, programming. Here we mean programming that addresses the unique needs of young men and young women so that they can actually benefit from employment and entrepreneurial trainings and, and, um, and activities. And we reviewed a couple of programs to actually see what works and what are some of the recommendations that we can make uh, to make youth livelihood programming in its broadest sense, uh, gender sensitive and more inclusive. Next slide, please. So I'll start with vocational skills training because a lot of our governments are actually um, expanding vocational skills training for, for, for young people. And what we see is, although a lot of this is happening, there hasn't been a lot of evaluations that actually look at benefits to both young men and young women. We sort of tend to look at it just as, 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 um, as youth. But we looked at two vocational skills training programs, one in Malawi and one in Uganda. The program in Malawi was running a training and an uh, apprenticeship uh, program for aspiring craftspersons. And the young men benefited from this program considerably more than young women did. Uh, young women began the program with less education, less cash on hand. They had to travel to, to the cities and even beyond the money it was difficult to travel to training sites and they had difficulty balancing their commitments to household and family responsibilities. Now, if you compare that with this empowerment and livelihoods for adolescents program in Uganda, that combined vocation, vocational training program, uh, in, but also included life skills, uh, training through adolescent development uh, clubs. And this program was successful in improving both vocational and sexual and reproductive health outcomes. And what we can conclude or what we concluded from this is that approaches that address vocational training or whether it's agriculture training, whatever training it is, alongside interventions that actually address some of the constraints that I talked about earlier, whether it's constraints of unpaid care work, work-life balance, that they have a much greater potential um, for success. I'll just give another quick example, next slide, of credit and cash for young entrepreneurs, because we are seeing this is also something that's happening across um, um, our countries. Um, you know, youth funds, uh, women enterprise funds that are also targeting um, young women and, 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 and cash grants. 
And we know, given the potential for youth entrepreneurship in the informal sector, we really want programs that provide cash and credit so that young entrepreneurs can be successful. We, we heard uh, Gloria in the last session talk about access to funds as a, as a constraint. And we've also, we also saw in these evaluations that young women especially had difficulty keeping cash for business expenses on hand. Uh, because of household expenses and in a lot of cases that they also didn't have much control over, over their money. But we found one program in Uganda that gave cash grants to young women entrepreneurs that had positive impact on, on, on income, but not always um, on other indicators where we would hope to see impact, such as independence, their status in the community, freedom from, from partner violence. And of course, this leaves us to speculate whether such a program could have led to better out outcomes if it had paid attention to some of these simultaneous household and family responsibilities of, of, of young women. And there are other livelihood uh, programs that were part of this, um, of this evaluation, if you go to the next slide, but I'll leave uh, the audience to just have a look, a quick look at that, and just go to my last slide in, uh, to, to conclude. So I'm going to close with re recommendations for, for gender sensitive youth livelihoods uh, programming, be it in agriculture, in vocational training, or in broad livelihood support to young men and young women. First is that livelihoods oriented interventions must consider employment and entrepreneurial training alongside the demands for, of the family and household for both young men and, and young women. And for young women, especially these family responsibilities often limit the amount of time they have available to initiate economic activities, as well as the, the, the scope of what is deemed suitable work, because they are also dealing with societal norms. We had that in the last session. And also, although fathers are expected to work, programs that incorporate their household and family roles need to facilitate a healthier transition to adulthood and provide the opportunity for new fathers, especially to participate in caregiving roles. Uh, second, the policies and programs need to be designed to mitigate the potential negative impact of structural and rural transformation and to recognize that these impacts are going to differ by gender. And, and finally, um, the importance of looking at both the productive and reproductive roles in both young men's and women's uh, lives. Concerns about marriage, fertility, parenthood are usually addressed to young women and tend to ignore young men. Yet these transitions to adulthood affect both young men and young women in different ways. Household and family responsibilities may actually pressure young men to find employment and recognizing the importance of both work and family responsibilities is, is an important first step in developing youth livelihood opportunities that are impactful and that are healthy. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne. Back to you.